Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From brand new audiobooks such as Master and Apprentice and Queen's Shadow to our blockbuster movie tie-in editions, you'll have plenty to keep you entertained. This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. I've been waiting for celebration all year long. Are you ready to celebrate? Hey, Chicago, what do you say? Back to that same old place. Oh, and guess what? This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Check one, two. Check. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, you guys are all awake and alert. I am extremely impressed. <laughs> nice job. All right, first thing we're going to do is I'm going to take a picture of all of you because this is so much better than I anticipated. And I had high expectations, but this is great. So be ready to smile for your close-up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let's see. You want to be on Popular Kenobi's Instagram page? Yeah. Let's do it. Too late. <laughs> All right. Here is everybody at the Mythology panel. You guys are amazing. All right. Okay. So it is definitely not my style to sit behind a microphone when I teach them a very, it's a very organic process. I like to move around a lot, but we're going to try it this way and see how it works. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this mythology panel. My name is Dan Zare. I am the host and co-creator of Coffee with Kenobi. I'm also a contributor to StarWars.com and IGN. Has anyone in here ever heard of Coffee with Kenobi? All right. If not, I, I will understand if you stare at your phone briefly to subscribe. I understand that. <laughs> All right, let's kick this thing off. All right, so uh, one note that I need to make sure that everybody is aware of. This initial panel is supposed to be myself and Clayton Sandell. Clayton works for ABC News, and he is the expert of the the behind-the-scenes stage. But because he works for ABC, he got called out on assignment. There's a lot of news going on today, as I'm sure you're very aware of, so he is not able to be with us, so that's unfortunate. Um, But, you know, duty calls. And then Chris Taylor, the author of How Star Wars Conquered the Universe, was going to help me as well. But he had to catch a flight. But you know what? I can honestly tell you I'm not nervous. I do this every day as a teacher, and I believe this is going to be a captive audience. I'm curious before we start, though, tell me, what is mythology? Anybody? Let's just do this the old school way. Go ahead and raise your hand and tell me, what is mythology? Yes, with the, the white coat. Is it art? Are you wearing an R2 coat? That is a wise man right there. <laughs> yes. He said mythology is stories and kind of the history of stories. Is that about what you said? You're right. Thank you, my friend. Well done. What, what he said, if you couldn't hear him, yes, give him a hand. What he said is that the mythology of Star Wars involves film, comic books, the novels and literature, the animated series. Clone Wars fans in here, Rebels fans, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At, oh, my, me too, me too. Mythology at its core, and this is what I explain to my students. What a mythology is, is it is a way for us to tell our stories and to move them along to the next generation. That's really what it is. If you think about when mythology... The first story ever created. Anybody know what the very first story ever was that people passed on? Any English professors in here? What did you say? I'm sorry. Epic of Gilgamesh. Do I have an Epic of Gilgamesh? Say that again. I'm sorry. The first written one. Exactly. I'm glad you said that. That's a good gig. So it is the first written one. What about the oral tradition? Yes, sir. 
Beowulf, I think, would be possibly one. The Say that again. The Talmud. The Talmud? Yes. I got another one. Yes. Cave paintings. Cave paintings. That might. That could possibly. But that was also uh, done through, of course, an animated style. Yes, sir. The Iliad. The Iliad. Yeah. Not, the Iliad is, is a very old story, but it's not as old as the other ones that we have mentioned. Right? Uh, yes. Sure. Ultimately, yeah, creation myths is certainly one. Basically, what a mythology does is it passes on the story. Your traditions, your cultures, your religion, what you believe, how you think you should raise your family, how you should treat someone who harms you. Is there such a thing as redemption? These are all parts of mythology, right? And this is one thing that I tell my students. I say, if you don't think passing on your story and your mythology is important, then I want you to take a moment and get out your phones and delete every social media account you've ever had and never get on them again for the rest of your life. And of course, they look at me like, there's no way. Well, of course there's no way. We, we have this in us. It's like an inherent thing. We want to pass on what we have learned, right? We want to pass on what is a sacred thing, what is important to us. And one of the ways we do that is through our mythology. Now, the oral tradition, of course, starts with storytellers who are very animated and very expressive. And it's very important because if you have a story that you're passing on your religion, your culture, and your history, if you're passing that on to other people, if you mess it up, if you forget it, there goes your culture. And I play a little game with them. I usually have students about 25 to 30 in a classroom, and we play the telephone game, right? Yeah. And I think the sentence I pick is like, Gooby, uh, let's see, Goofy juggled a bunch of goofy gophers, or just, I can't even say it, it's so absurd. So I write it on a piece of paper, and I hand it to the first student. Well, invariably, by the end, it's completely, completely different, right? And, that, and they laugh, and we have a good time, and it's really, really funny. And I say, I'm glad you think it's funny, but now when you die, no one's going to remember you or your family. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, it sounds harsh. Do you see why storytelling matters? Exactly. So what I explained to them is when they told these ancient stories, they would get up here, and they would tell their stories, and when they would tell them, the people in the audience knew these stories because they knew how important and how sacred it was to each of them. So what they would do is if someone would make a mistake, they would correct them. Now, I know in a room full of Star Wars fans, if someone makes a Star Wars mistake, no one would ever do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you see how Star Wars fits into all of this? Star Wars, obviously, is a bit of a different thing. It's a space sci-fi fantasy. It tells stories about heroes, about villains, about redemption, about the power of a family, both a surrogate, a nuclear family, and what happens to get them from point A to point B. It's all important. It's all sacred. It all fits in. You're passing on and telling a story that counts. And if there wasn't an anchor to it, we wouldn't be here right now at Star Wars Celebration Chicago. We just wouldn't. But it matters. It means something. This is truly our modern American mythology. George Lucas has said it repeatedly. I certainly tell my students that all the time. And we take some time uh, at the end of each mythology semester. I teach, I teach primarily seniors, but I also teach freshmen. And at the end of the unit, we cover Star Wars. And we go through a majority of the films, depending on you know, what we've gone through the rest of that semester. And it's amazing. What you see when these things happen is there are a number of students who haven't seen Star Wars, right? And that seems strange. And, I, of course, I say, don't your parents love you? <laughs> and we, you know, we laugh. I have a very good rapport with my students. And then I said, well, we have to fix this. We've got to make this count. So we show them A New Hope, right? Now, I know there's the machete order, of course. And I'm a fan of the machete order when you're an experienced Star Wars viewer. I think it takes things in context. Anyone not know what the machete order is? There's no shame. Perfect. The machete order is, in essence, you take episodes four and five, and then you take a break. And I'm going to insert the Phantom Menace in here because I like the Phantom Menace. Then you put in episodes one, two, and three, and then you go back to six. Now, what does that do for the story when you tell it in that context? I have an idea. You know what? I have an idea. As it turns out, I've got some microphones right up here. <laughs> I just need one person to come up here and tell me why that might be effective. Yes, sir, come on down. It's like Bob Barker. Yay. How's it going here? 
Come on up. You're on a celebration panel. Nice work. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. So the machete order, episodes four, then five, then one, two, three, six. Tell me what that does and how that changes the dynamic of the story. What it does is you're starting off with the Luke Skywalker story and almost backtracking to Anakin, but making the story more from Luke's perspective and then from Anakin's perspective on up. Exactly. Thank you very much. One of the most powerful things that this machete order does is that it gives the revelation of the twins more power, right? You don't find out about it on the bridge on Endor uh, in a, a very serious uh, but quick conversation. You actually see the birth of the twins. And when this happens, occasionally there will be a student that will miss the return of the Jedi because they'll be sick or they'll go on vacation or something. So this is their first way of learning about the twins. And it's amazing. And twins, of course, is a very ancient, sacred mythological tradition. There are a number of classical mythological con constructs, but how does it all work? There are a number of archetypes that happen in mythology, right? I mean, you, you certainly got the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell. We all know this. And sometimes we're like, oh, yeah, we've heard the hero's journey. I understand. But do you really? Because <laughs> a lot of words have been written about it, some of them by me. Uh, Joseph Campbell is a guy that believed in this Jungian archetype where he kind of believes that we have this thing inherent in us, these stories, you know, that they reach us no matter where the language is, right? No matter what's going on. I mean, if you think about ancient Greek mythology or Egyptian mythology, they didn't know what was going on on different sides of the planet, but there was just something that was inherent that they cared about that was important. They passed on these stories. So the hero's journey, uh, traditionally, there, I mean, there are different steps to it, but uh, at its core, it's really just kind of 12 steps. You know, the, anyone know the hero's journey? A couple of you? Wow. Okay. Well, I think I can handle this. All right. Good deal. At its essence, the hero's journey is about the hero who gets this call to adventure, right? And during their call to adventure, they discover hey, there's something that we need you to do. You're going to have to leave your house. Uh, you're going to have to leave where you're from. And it's important. Everything is riding on you. Well, then the hero refuses the call. And I want you to think about A New Hope while I'm talking about this. The hero says, oh, I can't. You know, I've got work to do. You know, it's not that I like the empire. I hate it. But there's nothing I can do about it right now. Right? Refuse the call. But ultimately, they accept the call. They meet a mentor a guide, think Merlin, or I don't know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, for example, right? And then they get an ancient talisman, which of course is what? A lightsaber, a mystical enchanted object, or often it's a weapon that they get that they need on their journey. They cross the first threshold, and when they go to this first threshold, they leave the comforts of their home and go into a brand new place. Anybody want to take a guess on where they cr Luke crosses the first threshold? Yes, sir. Moss Eisley. Moss Eisley is a good call. I mean, literally, it's a mountaintop experience. Think about it. Obi-Wan Kenobi is up there, and he says, Moss Eisley Spaceport, you will never find... I love... You are good students. <laughs> very, very good. Yes. So he goes there. He leaves the known world. All the rules have changed. He's a, he's a different person. He meets allies. Who are Luke Skywalker's allies in New Hope? This is like giving candy to a baby. <laughs> Han, Chewie, R2, 3PO. Of course, Obi-Wan is also his mentor, too. Uh, then they, they get to a section where... Oh, you better get that. Um, they get to the section where they, they enter the belly of the whale. When you enter the belly of the whale, and I would have prepared slides for this, but I just, I just assume that people know this because I bother my students about it all the time. Don't you feel sorry for them? Yeah. And when you get into the belly of the whale, you're completely surrounded and entrenched uh, from the known world. It's it. You're completely closed off. There's, you can't turn back because you don't have a choice. You're surrounded. Of course, it's inspired by Jonah and the whale from the Old Testament. But gee, where would Luke be completely cut off by the rest of the universe? It rhymes with Death Star. I was going to say it rhymes with meth jar, but it sounds like you knew that. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, right. And then ultimately, as we get out of the belly of the whale, there are other steps, but we'll just get kind of to the end of it here. There's, there's an important aspect of this 
uh, called apotheosis. Apotheosis is death and rebirth. Often, apotheosis is actual death, right? Is it safe for me to talk about the seventh Harry Potter book? <laughs> okay. Uh, Harry Potter actually dies in the book, but he comes back, right? Now, Luke doesn't die in A New Hope, or does he? Oh, yeah, this works. Uh, hand? Yeah, want to come up here? Yeah, you. My man. Actually, do we have a microphone? Do we, do we have a portable microphone that I can use? If only I had somebody in the audience that I could work with that helps me on coffee with Kenobi that could come. Oh, my gosh. Did you see what happened? I was meaning to call Mark. <laughs> it's Tom Gross, everybody. Yeah. Now you're on the stage. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you can. Tom is going to be for the future questions because there will be questions. You didn't know you had homework, but you do. All right. Hey, buddy. What's your name? Alex. Alex, nice to meet you. Tell me when Luke dies in A New Hope. He doesn't. I agree. <laughs> Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> no, tell me, but how does he fit into this apotheosis, this idea of death and rebirth? Well, I have no clue. Uh, you know what? That's okay. I think we got this. I think we got this. Wait, wasn't it Obi-Wan with the whole force? Obi-Wan does die. There is a death of the mentor step that we didn't talk about, so you're exactly right there. So I'm going to give him that. Death of the mentor, he's got it. Thank you. All right, so Tom's going to come out in the audience. You're fast. He's very fast. Uh, anybody you want. Yeah, tell me about the apotheosis. It's death and rebirth. Tell me why. They go in, they get crushed, they come out. <laughs> this is all true, but I would say there's something even better than that. Something even better. You know what? I like that one. I think that's quite nice, and there's a bit of a baptism thing going on there, but there's something even better. I'll give you, would you like, anybody want a hint? I think she knows, but he already, he already water bugged over there. I'm thinking about Oh. We're still in A New Hope, though. Although, you know what? I, I think there's actually something quite powerful that you're talking about. No, I, I want to hear what you have to say, just because I think it's going to be awesome. Go ahead. Okay, um, you know, because you referenced Joseph Campbell. Yes. Basically, he's a spirit and he's a spirit. So when he goes, when, I mean, basically, he goes kind of inviting him to confront something that's going to, it's like the death of the sin. Yes. He can never want to see that. And he doesn't know yet what it means. All he knows that it means is that everything he's ever believed is now in doubt. So you never go back to the old life. I agree. So that's like the death of the I think that's lovely and quite smart. Thank you. And the Empire Strikes Back, I think that's important. But I think this young lady up here has an idea for a new hope. Seriously, that, I like that. You should write for stars.com. <laughs> there's death of innocence there, for sure. But, but there's something, I agree with you, but there's something even more powerful than that. This apotheosis, I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. It's not actual death, but sometimes there is a spiritual death that is involved that can be much more powerful. I'll, we'll come over to you if he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, and then we're going to go to the next thing. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Manny's doing two. You're like co hosting with me. Um, okay, so I, I originally think it's like uh, the death of Obi Wan sort of served as like the death of the Jedi Temple and the death of his well, subtle. All right, I'm just going to tell you because I, I we only have a short amount of time, unfortunately. Um, it's the trench run. Right? Yeah, who, who, who kind of thought that? Yeah. In the trench run, Luke, you've switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Nothing. 
I'm all right. As we saw before, the initial pilot that does this, he uses his targeting computer, doesn't work. Relies on technology, relies on his logic, right? Things that make sense. Faith is believing in things that you can't see, that you can't quantify, but you believe that they're there, whether you can see them or not. That act of Luke shutting off his targeting computer and dialing in with the force, which he's very, very new to, and he's able to destroy the Death Star, that's apotheosis. That is a spiritual death because he's never going to be the same. His outlook on life is completely different. He has changed irrevocably because of this act. That's his apotheosis. Then you have the return of the hero. They go back, and then they go back to the world differently. That's the hero's journey. That's, that's just one little construct of mythology and how it works. And we talk about this every single week on Coffee with Kenobi. I see some of you are most likely subscribing now. <laughs> I'm glad. I can't wait to hear from you. I want to move on to the next thing. At the end, we're going to have a chance for all of you to ask questions, too. So don't worry about that. What's this gets out at, what, 4.30? Oh, we got this. We got this. All right, so incorporating Star Wars into the curriculum. All right. So, some of you may be aware of this, but a couple years ago, I was in a Target Star Wars commercial. Anybody know that? Wow, you need to see it. <laughs> Over six million views on Facebook alone. It's a Target Row 1 commercial. There's a rebel in all of us, okay? In this commercial, one of the things, there are a number of different Star Wars social media influencers or big hardcore Star Wars fans in it. And at its impetus, it's about how do you celebrate your fandom. One of the things that I do is I use Star Wars in my classroom. Now, not all the time. I don't think that's a good idea. I think there needs to be balance. And even I would get tired of Star Wars if I talked about it every single day. Well, I guess I do, <laughs> but not professionally. Uh, so I use Shakespeare and Star Wars in my curriculum. I think there's a lot of power in that. I think. The hero's journey, is, of course, is something powerful. There are a number of literary elements and motifs that are inherent in this. But take the tragedy of Hamlet, right? Hamlet, if you're not familiar with the play, I mean, of course you know the name. Hamlet is probably the most powerful experience, uh, I think, in narrative. Maybe Hamilton is close to that? <laughs> Hamilton's pretty great, too. But it's an incredible thing, right? And ultimately, what Shakespeare does with a tragic hero is... He takes someone, and I want you to think about Revenge of the Sith while I'm telling you these things. He takes someone from a position of power, and they're beloved by their culture. They're beloved by their community. But ultimately, they have a tragic flaw, some fatal error in judgment or weakness of character that completely changes them. And they can't get away from it. They can't get out of their own way, right? So for Hamlet... There are a number of flaws that he has, right? He overthinks things. Um, he's very passionate. He's very impetuous, although not to the degree that he wants to be. Anakin Skywalker, a place of great position. I mean, he's the chosen one. It doesn't get much more powerful than that. He is someone who's beloved by the Jedi Order. Uh, he's arguably, I don't think he's arguable, I think he's the most powerful Jedi that ever lived. I mean, I guess we could debate that, and I, I think there are other opportunities to discuss. Who thinks Anakin's the most powerful Jedi? I'm not saying he's your favorite. I'm saying he's probably the most powerful. We'll see how it all pans out in episode nine. Uh, but his fatal flaw is, well, he's got pride, doesn't he? He's got a ton of pride. You know, pride comes before the fall. He's also arrogant. He's also got this insatiable desire to prove himself. And think about that. This is why mythology is important. We have this in us too, don't we? We have this need to prove ourselves to people. We have this incredible desire to want to be validated, to want to be loved. That's called being human. That's a good thing. Anakin has those things too, but his whole life he's been taught to suppress these feelings. And at the end of all of this, things go south very, very badly. They go so far south that he's surrounded by lava. It doesn't get much more south than that. <laughs> it's powerful. He's a tragic hero. And at the end, in Shakespeare... The tragic hero recognizes their tragic flaw, they embrace it, they're changed, and then they're dead. And that, I think that happens to Anakin. It now takes a couple of movies for that to happen. But that's a perfect archetype. So Target asked me, hey, well, if you teach Star Wars, how do you do it? I told him the story. 
I uh, ended up in this commercial. And what they did was, and maybe I'll show it at the end. I, I don't really like attention. Just kidding, I love it. <laughs> um, and it just shows kind of how you can combine those things. That's not the only way you can combine Star Wars in your classroom. Are there any teachers in here, by the way, that use Star Wars in their classroom? <laughs> That's fantastic. Greetings. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Looking to catch up on the latest Star Wars books? Try listening to them on audio. Featuring sound effects, top-notch narrators, and music directly from the movies, Star Wars audiobooks are the definitive listening experience. From Luke Skywalker to Kylo Ren to Admiral Ackbar, you'll recognize all of your favorite characters. Listen to movie tie-ins like The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens to book titles such as Master and Apprentice and Pirate's Price. Don't forget to pre-order Dooku, Jedi Lost, available only on audiobook, on sale April 30th. With Star Wars audiobooks, you'll have plenty of Star Wars listening to keep you entertained. It's a very important lesson, too. I mean, honestly, that's one of my favorite things about teaching literature. I think it's one of the few subjects, and I'm obviously biased, but I think it's one of the few subjects where you, you are teaching empathy because you're being asked to walk in the souls of these characters that you're reading about. Right? You have to be empathetic to that to really embrace the story. There are a number of really great stories I mean, that, that come from, from this idea. This idea is, there's actually a website called Star Wars in the Classroom that some of you may be aware of. And it's, it's just this huge data bank of different lessons for all ages, for all different types of curriculum, kindergarten all the way through college. Uh, and there's just a lot of stuff out there. You can use Star Wars in a lot of different ways in your classroom. So why is mythology important? All right. I mean, we talked about this a little bit already, but mythology teaches us I really more about ourselves than anything. Mark Twain uh, has this great quote. I'm not going to get it exactly verbatim, but in essence, he said, fiction is inclined to tell the truth, whereas nonfiction won't always do that, right? Because, you know, we, you know, the, let's say the victor tells the story, tells their story. In a fictional, you can make some really serious commentary on society and what's going on, and you can, you can window dress it under the, the guise of it's a mythology, but it's really not. Yes, sir? It seems as though they use the stories to pass on the most important values. I love that. Yeah, they, they use the stories to pass on the most important values. Exactly. And again, why is that important to us? Yes. What do you hold most dear? What do you hold the most sacred? You know, you pass on your values, your beliefs. I mean, what, what does Luke Skywalker teach us? Or as a culture, if, if someone came from another island and they didn't speak English and they weren't familiar with the Star Wars story, or someone came from another planet, sure, let's do that, we're at Star Wars Celebration, and they watched Star Wars, what do you think that they would learn about us as people? All right, what kind of story would they learn about what we care about as people just watching A New Hope? And by the way, if you're not, again, with Joseph Campbell in The Hero's Journey, George Lucas studied under Joseph Campbell. He created A New Hope with the framework of the hero's journey in mind. This is all there. Go ahead. Pretty much what they learned is that we create stories about people who are flawed to show ourselves that we are flawed. And to give an idea of if we fall down Certain paths, we will ultimately end that path. That's beautiful. Right. Right. No, that's that's beautifully said. Thank you. The uh, the idea, and this is something that you had talked about earlier about Dagobah and Luke's cave. The cave sequence. I think perfectly encapsulates kind of the nature of all of this stuff. And now there are two major cave moments, I think. There are a lot of them. You know, there's certainly some things in Rebels that happen, some stuff in Clone Wars that happens. But ultimately, in The Empire Strikes Back on Dagobah, or with Rey, right, in The Last Jedi, there are both sequences there where the hero goes into a cavern or a dark place and and this is again this is almost biblical as well they 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 go into these caves 
and there's a change that happens because they don't know their identity. They don't really know who they are and they come out of it a little bit different. Sometimes it's not what they want to see. Luke comes out and he sees, when I was a kid and Darth Vader's helmet exploded, I said to my mom, who's that? What's that? Why is Darth Vader like a boy or something, right? And she said, that's Luke. And I didn't understand then what that actually meant, the heaviness of that, of that sequence, which is if you keep making these impetuous choices and not listening to your teachers and your parents and your mentors and running off and doing things impetuously, bad things can happen. There's history there behind that, right? When Luke is about to go into the cave, sorry, microphone. When Luke is about to go into that cave, he says, Luke says, what's in there? And Yoda says, only what you take with you. So Luke brings aggression. He brings violence. He brings his blaster and his lightsaber. So what does he find in there? He finds aggression. He finds violence. He finds Darth Vader, the biggest bad in the galaxy. And he chooses to face it with violence. And ultimately, we know how that turns out. Now he's called Lefty. <laughs> Too soon? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, there, I think that's important. And for Ray, Ray learns something equally important, and I guess somewhat controversial, although I think it's quite beautiful, and, and I'm very at peace with it. But Ray discovers there's this long line of Rays, right? This huge line of Rays. It's almost like she's waiting in line with herself. She keeps waiting in line to see what she wants to see at the end of this. Ultimately, there is an end, although it seems to be forever. I would imagine sitting on Jakku, you know, in a, in a broken down ad app playing on your iPad all the time would probably get a little tiresome. That was a joke. She doesn't have an iPad. <laughs> so then at the end of this, she, there's this, like, this hazy mirror, this reflection. And, she's about, and I remember, I know you remember this now too. What were you thinking when you first saw that and you see these faces walk up? And Ray sees, oh my gosh, we're going to find out who Ray's parents are. We're going to find it out. And then she sees her own reflection. Now, some people were disappointed in that, and some people didn't understand it. I don't think I understood it the first time either. I really had to kind of marinate on what that meant. But ultimately, what Ray learns is that she sees herself. She's good enough already. She doesn't need her parents. She can be who she is already. And I think that's beautiful. I mean, we don't, I think this is a world where we need stuff like that. You know, whatever your family dynamic was like, maybe it was perfect. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a little bit average. Either way, you get to shape your own destiny. You got to figure out who you want to be. And Ray figures that out. And boy, does she figure that out. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens in The Rise of Skywalker, that lesson didn't go away, right? She had to accept who she was. Even if her parents were, I don't know, he-Man and Tila. I'm not even going to use the Star Wars reference. <laughs> I don't want to put that out there. But uh, whoever they're going to be, she had to accept who she was so she could move on to the next phase of her life. She had to. That was the only way that she was going to grow. That's a wonderful metaphor when you're in high school, when you're in college, when you're trying to find your profession, right? My, prof my first profession, I was in insurance for like eight years and I was miserable. And now insurance is a wonderful profession. We need it, but it wasn't for me, right? I need to find something. I need to find my own journey, my own little cave experience where I had to look in my mirror and decide who do I want to be. Ray figures that out. I figured that out. I became a teacher and it's led me to some pretty great places because I listened to my potential and I got out of my own way. And that's what I think all of you can do too. That's what I encourage my students to do, right? You have those journeys of self-discovery that resistance, I love that it's called the resistance. You know, resistance makes muscles grow, right? It makes them stronger. Resistance in life propels you to the next step. And I think we see that in the Star Wars mythology. That is why mythology is important. Who has questions? There we go. There we go. About anything. Okay. We got about 10 minutes. So, so I think some of the more popular things that we've seen come out of Star Wars are the other things with Mortis. Uh, do you think we'll see any of those things in live action or in the future content moving forward? Right. Because you're not affiliated with the BBC on Masters. It's going to be episode 9. <laughs> I don't know. I certainly don't know that. Uh, uh, real quick, though, Tom, uh, you said there were powerful themes in Mortis. I know what they are. 
I think I do, but I would love to hear what you think, because you're going to illuminate my mind. Uh, well, like the father represents the balance, and he's looking to have a successor, and we have the daughter representing the light, and the brother representing the daughter, and just kind of the balance and the ongoing struggle we have going back and forth with each other. I love, yeah, the balance, um, the, the darkness and light thing, I definitely think that's going to be powerful. I don't know if Morris will actually show up as a revelation. I don't know if JJ cares about that. He should, and I know the, sco- the story group, group does, pardon me. So I don't know, I, I hope it does, because I think the, the Mortis arc, if you're not familiar with it, is in the Clone Wars. It's season three? Yeah. And it's three episodes where Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka go to this planet. Who knows the name of the planet? Mortis, hence the Mortis arc. Very good. And uh, there's some amazing things that happen. I'm not going to give it away for you because it's some of the most powerful Star Wars storytelling you will ever see. But the, the ideas of darkness and light and balance and struggle with who you're going to be, wonderful mythological constructs and themes are all inherent there. I think we'll see those ideas in Episode Nine. I think they're going to be very heavy, actually. I certainly hope they are. Um, in the hero's journey, the, the end of the journey, you come back to the place at which you began and you find that it's not the same uh even though it's the same place which is to say classically you return to innocence right. but it's an innocence of wisdom which sounds like an oxymoron and yet i mean that's why it's the highest achievement in here uh, lots of examples in, in real life throughout tons of spirituality and traditions and things certain I'm curious to hear what you think in episode nine that innocence could possibly look like if you were to follow theories for some of our characters. Please don't turn it back against me. Oh, yeah. You know me well already. See, I always say to my students, um, I know you don't think so, but what do you think you might say if you did? That's usually, that's, but I won't do that. I think um, basically about innocence. I think what innocence means is. I, innocence is not a synonym for naivete, right? And I think an innocence means kind of a purity about life, about self, uh, uh, inner peace, right? What does uh, Ray say about Luke at the end of Last Jedi? Peace and purpose, right? That's, that's innocence. That's because it's really joy. You're untainted by the darkness. You're able to rise above the darkness because of that innocence, that inner peace. Does that make sense? Very good. Um, no, go ahead. On the topic that you before the question started, you were talking about um, my religious practice has to do with third eyes, past lives, and stuff like that. So I work with this this balance all the time. But the way you just worded it hit just a little bit too close to home. Oh. How when you went through that moment of finding and discovering that how. Um, how did it happen? Is that what you're going to ask me? Kind of. How did you get through? Because for me, it's something I'm constantly struggling with. Sure. No, I, I, think, I think everybody in the room feels the same way to a different degree. Uh, for me, it was more like my whole life I, I kept thinking, I don't want to be a teacher. I don't think I can handle discipline. I don't know if students are going to like me. I don't know if I'm going to want to do this. I kept telling myself reasons why not to do something. And I think that's the universe trying to tell you something. Right? So once I stopped telling myself why I shouldn't do something and started realizing and only tell myself reasons why I should do something, then it just, be, it just lit up. I mean, I can honestly tell you, the day that I decided I wanted to be a teacher, I sat up and I looked at the wall. And it was a white wall, which I kind of like the symbolism of that. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be a teacher. And that was it. I didn't know how to go about doing it. I just knew I had to do it. Because when you start telling yourself reasons why to do something instead of why not to, I mean, look at Luke and Ray in The Last Jedi. There's a lot of, talk about the refusal of the call, a lot of denial of self. Once Luke gets out of his own way and accepts it, once Ray gets out of her own way and accepts that she can be herself without this baggage of who her family is over her, then the path becomes very clear for both of them. And I think it can be the same for you. Maybe actually this is a little related to that um, topic. It's the, the differences in scale. Like there's different scales of the mythological arc going on at the same time throughout the movie. So like, Luke has his hero's journey in the first movie, it's like a complete cycle. Right. But he also has a hero's journey that's longer on a bigger scale of the, the original trilogy. 
Yes. And so it's possible maybe we'll see like an intergenerational like giant cycle over all my movies that we're, we're seeing the same. So it's not it's not like there's one hero journey no. in Star Wars and when it's over the movie is like there's no more movies, there's no more story. Mm -hmm. It's like it keeps coming back and it, and it happens on multiple like levels. I agree. I, and I think that's a life thing, right? Luke does have his full hero's journey, but he's still not done, right? It's, it's uh, not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? We're always learning those, those different ways to see things. That, you know, when I decided to be a teacher, that doesn't mean life was perfect, because it's not, but it's pretty close, because you get to embrace those challenges. Luke has to embrace, you know, I love the beauty of the fact that he starts on Tatooine, which is hot, and he's alone, and he's got no one, and then he starts the Empire Strikes Back, and he's not alone, but it's not hot, right? And he's not naive, but he kind of is, right? He's still going through his own hero's journey, and that's just like all of us as well. We probably only have time for one more. Yeah. Uh, just want to think you guys off of that. Uh, do you think, and without thinking step by step, you know, I don't really have a definitive answer for each step, but do you think the force itself has a hero's journey over Wow. What a beautiful question. What a beautiful question. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Does the force have a hero's journey? Well, to have a hero's journey, I think there has to be sentience and purpose. And, and I think the force transcends that. I think there's no room for growth for the force because the force... You know, it surrounds us, it penetrates us, it binds the galaxy together. It's the inner workings of all of this. Uh, it acts out hero's journeys throughout all of us, but I don't think it has its own hero's journey because it's, it's something more than that. Want to see the Target commercial? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, I wasn't prepared for this, so let me pull it up real quick. Yeah, one more question while I'm pulling this up. No, no, the, the gray, I think the gray is in the Han Solos of the world. I mean, think about what Han Solo's wearing, you know what I mean? I mean, he's got a white undershirt, but it's, it's got a black vest, right? Black and white, that's a little bit of gray. He's not really sure where he's going. I mean, that's a beautifully art, you know, illustrated in the awesome movie Solo. You know, you know you're the good guy, but he's not sure yet. He's not ready for that all white dressing. You know, I mean, there's, I think there is gray. And I think there's some beauty in that. I mean, look what Ray, look what Ray's wearing, right? She's got crazy. It's not because she's struggling. It is, yeah. It's pretty crazy. I'm not sure the does, will the audio work on this? Do I have to do something different than that? You know what? Don't worry about it. Um, if you want to look it up, uh, you can find it on coffeewithkenobi.com. You will certainly find the commercial there. You can search. There's a rebel in all of us on YouTube, and we'll show it to you that way. You, oh, I could do that. You're smart. All right, we'll try it. Just for you. First time I saw it, I was like, Whoa. Watching Princess Leia take charge, I thought, girls can do that. I like the characters that do their own thing. Like me. It is an unconventional way to connect with the kids. But students love it when you use Star Wars to teach Shakespeare. Do or do not, there is no try. That's my parenting motto. Star Wars helps me teach my kids to stand up for hope. For good will always prevail. It's about being true to yourself. Even if that means having stormtroopers walk you down the aisle. <laughs> not just fans. Not just parents. Not just teachers. Not just girls. Rebels. Hey, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Have a, well, I guess celebration's over. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for spending it with me. Thank you so much. Find me on Coffee with Kenobi each and every week. <laughs>
This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along.